Next item, Madam Clerk. Number three on the agenda. 2016-075 Board Minutes Managing the City Zoning Code for Affordable Housing by removing the provision section 7.12. One, shall not apply to urban renewal uses. Motion away the read by Councillor Kamuchi. Councillor Kamuchi, do you want to speak? I'll defer to my senior colleague if you'd like to make a remark. How's that I'm sorry, what is my name? Junior colleague. <laughs> he's, he's giving you the mic. <laughs> again, I thank you, uh, Council Kamuchi, but again, I want to uh, point out that it is Council Kamuchi who's, who's raised this again and brought it back out. Uh, you know, I don't see this as anything new. Uh, I see this as a restoration of the way it was before. The way it was when uh, Councillor Hamley had actually first constituted the first um, inclusionary zoning ordinance, it was intended to cover the entire city. There's nothing I can add that we didn't hear in terms of the need for such a, a measure um, that you saw demonstrated through um, the public hearing, particularly the words that, uh, again, Reverend Bennett brought to it, but also from the gentleman who testified to the reality of what's going on there in terms of affordable housing. It's so funny because back in 1999, I think it was, when Councilor Hanley introduced this, it was what he kept referring to as police and teachers housing. You know, unfortunately, there's a misperception of what affordable housing is, and, and what's often identified with is housing that may be Section 8 or, or rental voucher housing types of things that are, again, focused on people who are in far uh, more difficult financial straits. The affordable housing and the inclusionary zoning ordinance was really intended for that group that never gets any assistance, and that's roughly that group between the 60% of median to 100% of median income, that those are the folks that really struggle. And, and I know I get calls from them every day, and I'm sure some of you have, and some of you who refer them to me know that, um, that this is the reality, that people are struggling out there with the cost of housing. It's interesting one of those little ironies, some people who even like walk at the concept of affordable housing are then in turn some of the same people who complain to you saying, oh my son or daughter can't live, afford to live in Quincy. Well this is what this ordinance was meant to address. Sheldon uh, Bennett raised what some of the ethical considerations are, but part of my interest in this and what brought me into the city council, contrary to what I do during my day job, quite honestly, was my own concern about the approach that we take, which is a kind of less than planned approach to development um, within the city. And what my real concern always has been about the inclusionary zoning ordinance really focuses around the 40B provisions of the state law is that those provisions oftentimes have been utilized um, for people who want to achieve something other than affordable housing, but use the 40B laws as a leverage and a pressure. <coughs> it should be obvious to everyone with the number of units that are going online here in the city of Quincy, um, that that ratio between affordable units and uh, available units is, is growing to the point where we may not be needed our obligations under 40P. If that's the case, that creates a very difficult situation. Some of the people who have uh, talked about this impacting, and again, I'm sure Councilor Kamuchi will, will get to his amendment in a moment, I think that given the good faith that people have approached uh, the law as it was, that certainly has to be entertained. But I think that on um, other matters, when people are talking about those who may even come in, who are looking for the certificate of consistency, those of us who participated on the trust know that oftentimes those issues are leveraged. And what this does essentially is it gives the city another tool in terms of working with developers who want to come in, ways of, of again, through an inclusionary zone, zone concept, which is swapping off one value for another value to the benefit of everyone. And so I just think it's time to put it back the way it was. Um, like Reverend Bennett put it very well. I mean, this was part of 
a master the plan where the master developer had agreed to a significant amount of contribution into the affordable housing trust. That situation has changed, and if we're going to continue particularly, which I think is wise, which again, I appreciate both the projects that we do presently have before us in terms of this mixed-use concept, we are talking about the addition of more residential units. So I would uh, motion tonight that we accept 2006-075, uh, vote that positive this evening. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Finn. So, motion by Council Finn. No. I would ask that. He did make a motion. I'd ask that he withdraw the motion so I can move to. Oh, excuse me. That's I, I apologize. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I okay. will withdraw. I'm sorry. I'll, All right. You can recognize Council Finn. All right, right. Council Finn. I'll figure you. My senior colleague. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my senior colleague. That's right. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Council Finn. I, I've been banging this drum for so long and so loud up here to talk about the downtown that I don't feel like I have to advocate for this measure to pass because I have been doing so for quite some time and I've forced you all to suffer through that. So I won't make it do it again, Madam President. Um, I will just point to the, the, the comments that were made tonight in support of this at the public hearing with the Reverend, with the Reverend, Reverend said tonight um, about if we don't do something like this, if we don't change this, then downtown will become an enclave for the wealthy. Uh, and that was striking, uh, it, because that's really what it will become. Um, we heard from the Quincy teacher who said he's struggling to, to stay in Quincy because of the, the lack of affordable housing. Um, and it makes you think he's, he's good enough to teach our kids during the day, but not good enough to be our neighbor after work. I mean, that's what, that's what the, the, the debate is. That's what it, it comes down to. It's about our values as a community. It's about making sure that teachers, police, fire, and blue-collar workers continue to live and raise their families in our city. Um, and again, I'm not going to belabor this. People can hold their conscience on it. Um, but I would, I would like to make uh, an amendment to the order that's before us. I believe I had one down memo today, and I asked that to put the record, um, uh, the public record for it, um, for this hearing. Um, the, Amendment would simply add a footnote uh, that says this amendment shall not apply to any ground objective for which an application for the certificate of consistency has been submitted to the planning prior to April 1st, 2007. Um, that specifically would um, exclude the O'Connell project and the LBC project from being a part of this. And given that LBC is a generously offered to pave so many roads, I think that um, um, the, the fact that, that the O'Connell project and the LBC project are so far along in their planning um, and have already submitted certificates of consistency that it just it wouldn't it would be fundamentally unfair to hold them to a standard when they play by a certain set of rules that were previously in existence uh, for us to change the rules while they're quite close to the finish line. So I, I would ask um, I would move that the body adopt the amendment as proposed to Council Order 2016 -0. 075. So, motion to amend uh, by Councilor, probably seconded by Councilor Finn. On the, this is on the motion to amend Council of Forest. Um, no. On the overall motion, so I'll. Oh, okay. So, wait, so this will be, this vote will be on the motion to amend. Anyone wishing to speak? All right, seeing no one, Madam Council, keep call the roll. On the motion to amend per Council of Families. Councilor King? Yes. Councilor Crow? Yes. Councilor Dupont? Yes. Councilor Finn? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor LaFarge? Yes. Councilor Leanne? Yes. Councilor Kamuji? Yes. President Hughes? Yes. Nine members. Amendment was Thank you. And on the amended motion, I would have to Okay, so motion to approve uh, by Councilor Kamuji, seconded by Councilor Finn on the motion to approve Councilor of the Forest. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Along with Councilors Finn and Helen I represent this board body on the City's Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And as we come through these different projects, we've talked about when's the right time to bring affordable housing as um, the, or as the inclusionary zoning ordinance back um, into the downtown area. 
And while we had agreed with Streetworks when we set a policy that it would be on site units and the money would be then uh, earmarked to the trust, we'd be able to sprinkle um, those investments throughout the city neighborhoods. We've been able to do that with a lot of the projects that are before us. And I think people need to understand that as we're talking about affordable housing and we're talking about the URDP area, um, it doesn't necessarily mean these units are coming in on site, but they're coming into downtown. Those developers have options, which is either to provide, provide those units on site or to do a payment in lieu of um, program. And we've had developers citywide uh, provide some of those options. So I think it's really important for people to understand that the affordable housing is a set, in, uh, set rental rate set by um, federal standards, typically $1,500 is the uh, one bedroom rate at this point for, for, in, in, for the affordable units. Um, I think we've seen projects come, come to fruition and we have the progress. I know I've had concerns as to um, what are we doing relative to the financeability of some of these projects with our requirements. You know, we, Council Pelucci and I write frequently about public art as something that what um, we wanted to see come to fruition and when do we become burdensome by adding things in addition like affordable housing. I'm going to be supporting this motion. I think it's important. Council Pelucci articulated it very well and has the time. Um, to bring this back, and we think it's particularly respectful to those projects that come before us that are pending, um, that they are in compliance as submitted. So um, I'll be supporting it this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forrest. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay, Councillor Devana. Thank you, Madam President. I really wasn't going to speak, and I'm not against affordable housing by any means, any means at all. Before we got into the council, before I got into the council, it was an in, 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 to uh, incentivize what had happened with the street works deal. The street works deal went because you were giving away the house. You have to think about that for a second. These investors, these developers, are taking chances as well, and that downtown has not been done for 40 years. And as a small business owner and a contractor, if you're going to squeeze me on one end, I have to figure out the profit margin that you're going to make. Now, I'm not against affordable housing. I'm not saying that by any means. But you have to understand that that downtown is not done yet. We're still in the middle phase here of finishing the downtown. It's a very important, vital part of the city moving forward, in my personal opinion. And we still have some parcels left over left. And to shortchange some of those parcels, by bringing this back in, I, I just feel that we got the momentum going, we're, we're, we're at it, and I want to see more affordable housing outside of the district. I want to see more affordable housing coming out of that trust that we have close to $14 million sitting in, that other investors and other developers can go in and start like really attacking these blight areas outside the district. So to, to put that into a, um, into a situation, I, I just feel that, um, Everybody's at risk here. Everybody's going to take a risk, whether it be the, the, the citizens of the city, as well as the developers, um, us, as, us, us as, as a council. So when I look at it sometimes, is we're not finished. We're in the middle here. And there's going to be a situation that happens in this downtown or throughout the city where we're going to be increasing apartments, increasing condominiums, and it's happening throughout the entire city. I would like to see uh, more affordable housing outside of the district, the URDP. So with that being said, uh, I congratulate my two colleagues. I, you know, but, you know, I, I, like, I like the idea, but before I came onto the council, it was not set up that way. And to follow through on what's going on with the city, and I think we're going in the right direction. I don't want to lose the momentum that we're, we're going. So I, I will not be in support of this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I thought I was finished. Uh, and as much as I appreciate my colleagues, uh, the Honorable Counsel at Large's comments related to his congratulations, I know that we have entered, accordingly, supposedly, the era of alternate facts as it relates to uh, political discourse. But let me point out something. I was here for Street Works. If you think the failure of Street Works had anything to do with the inclusionary zoning ordinance, uh, 
that's just not factual. That's just not true. I think there are very specific reasons we know why street works failed, and I certainly don't want to dig those things up as optimistic as we are in the new direction that we're moving. But if these were so limited, this, this ordinance was so nefarious and burdensome, how do you explain the hundreds and hundreds of units that have already been built outside that district? And again, um, inclusionary zoning, the whole concept is built upon giving, forgetting in some ways. And as these are negotiated, the inclusionary zoning ordinance is another tool that the city has working, not merely to get back something back from developers, but to also offer them something. And it's okay to oppose something, but this kind of rudimentary uh, economic picture that you have of it just isn't true. And I feel like I have to, to state that. Um, and again, the two projects, in fact, are here. And I agree with Councilor Palmucci's uh, uh, amendment for that very reason. It would be fundamentally unfair to move the goal line again on them, given the fact that they've already started. But uh, again, I just all I can do is encourage my colleagues um, to understand the benefit that this brings the hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars it's generated for other projects and how critical it is to be, again, part of the entire city and not just to outside. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Finn. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone else? All right, Madam Clark, if you would call the roll. Councilor Finn. Yes. Councilor Crow? Yes. Councilor Devon? No. Councilor Finn? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor LaFarge? Yes. Councilor Leanne? Yes. Councilor Pamuji? Yes. President Hughes? Yes. Thank you. The measure passed? Yes. Thank you. Next up. Number four on the agenda, 2017-056, a gift of $300 from various donors to the DA program. Just make sure that the donor is recognized about with a letter of correspondence. Yes. Thank you, ma'am, for the gift, and I would uh, move the passage, please. All right. Motion to approve by Council 12, seconded by Council Devon on the motion by Council. Council King? Yes. Council Crow? Yes. Council Devon? Yes. Councilor Finn. Yes. Councilor Harris. President, uh, uh, sorry. Councilor LaFarge. Yes. Councilor Leanne. Yes. Councilor Conway. Yes. President Hughes. Yes. Eight members. The gift passes. Next is number five on the agenda, 2017. Wait, wait. Okay. I move for Council Palmucci. Okay. Uh, Council Order 2017-057, resolve amending City Council Rule 46 by Council Palmucci. Is there's a motion to move to the Rules Committee? Motion by Councilor Palmucci, seconded by Council LaForest. All those in favor? I uh, yes, have it great. So we moved to committee. That will end our formal agenda for this evening. Uh, next, we move to approval of previous meeting minutes. You have minutes from the April 3rd, uh, 2017 meeting in front of you. Uh, motion to approve the minutes by Councilor Liang, seconded by Councilor King. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it great. Communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and the city boards. Madam Clark. I do have uh, two new traffic requests to refer to Ordinance Committee for Advertising. Board 3 Council King, install one way designation on Brook Street going north from Arlington Street to Newport Ave. And install do not enter sign on Brook Street, Newport Ave side. Okay, motion. Refer to Ordinance for Advertising. Thank you. Did you want to see Council King? Business from the preceding meeting. Okay, 
Uh, reports of committees. Council of the Forest. Council order. Okay. Uh, last, thank you, Madam President. Um, two weeks ago, the Ordinance Committee um, held its third meeting on Council Order 2016-285 in order relative to the land disposition agreement for Parcel H1 in the Hancock parking lot. I'd like to bring that matter out of the committee this evening. Okay. So motion to move council order 2016-285 LTA parcel H1 and mm -hmm. parking lot. Motion to move out of um, committee by council four, seconded by councilor Harris. On the motion, all those in yes, council okay. I'm feeling very good about the passage of the affordable housing ordinance, but it's at this particular point in time that I do wish to just register, and I, I know. Uh, Council of Forest has suggested that this, but this really is something that we should have had established either a committee hearing or it should have been on the agenda. I apologize to all the people and the consultants who had to sit here this evening and the like, rather than to have it bring it out from committee. The second thing is, is that this is such a large and important issue that, um, uh, again, the idea of not having notice out there regarding the fact that this is going to be with the council, uh, that we're actually discussing that or considering that this evening, it is not a good precedent to set. And so, uh, again, I was seriously thinking of just simply, a, but it's clear cut to me what the will of this body is, that they wish to, they want to deal with it this evening. And, um, you know, I'm more than happy to accept that. But, but again, it's just not the way we should be doing things, particularly with things that are this critical this important. So with that, I've had my, the chance, uh, and, and I will also point out that Mr. Geary is not here this evening. Secondly, the, the final redacted version that I got, I believe, was at around 3.30 was the first one, and then there was a corrected one that started receiving 4.30 today. I did not know until Monday that this was going to be a matter that would actually be being brought up here. Now, things happen. Clearly, something happened here, but I just really want to stress this is not a good precedent or way of dealing with these matters. And so, um, with that, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you know, go with the rule of the body. Thank you. Thank you, Council Finn. So I do want to address that uh, briefly uh, because so when we decided to put this as an ordinance committee um, to be called out of committee on the agenda rather than place it on the agenda officially. Uh, it wasn't an attempt to elude any public uh, advertising or to uh, play any kind of game or to uh, not inform the council. The thought from the clerk uh, was that, uh, and, 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 and myself at the time, was that because this was on the calendar, it was properly before the council, it could be brought out of the committee. So I, I don't think anything improper has been done. I realize, I don't, I don't think you're saying that either. Um, or maybe you are, I don't know. No, I, I, again, yeah. Yeah, present. I'm truly, I'm not suggesting there's any impropriety. What I'm suggesting, there might be, um, I can't even think of the word of it, but in terms of procedure, it's not good. I mean, we have, we have all of these people who are sitting here. We could just as easily have had a scheduled uh, uh, committee hearing uh, that we could have dealt with this with the full amount of time it deserves. We're looking at the time I'm now. It's, it's not. It's close to 9:15. Yeah, We're bringing up this topic, and, and again, I just can't understand how it happened or why it happened. But I just don't think it's appropriate. I and again, I'm not. This, I don't think there's any malice behind it. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm suggesting it. I believe it, it matters such as land disposition agreements. It's a bad practice to get into. I want to remind you at the last meeting, we actually had a vote, and that vote was that it was to remain in committee. Uh, again, it was a, a, the proposal or uh, the a motion that was put forward failed, and it was ordered to be kept into committee. 
you know, and part of the reason that was was because we did not have our, our counsel at that particular meeting. And uh, again, we did not have Ms. McKinney at that, at that meeting. Or is it McKinney? Forgive me. Hey, I'm sorry. Sure, and, and we are both here this evening. Yeah, I know they're both here, and they've been sitting here now for since 7.30. Uh, and, and again, I'll, in my comments, because I certainly don't desire to keep them sitting here any longer, but, but again, it's just uh, a way to run an airline. But thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, still on the motion. Motion to bring out committee. All right, motion to bring it out of committee, seconded by Councilor Harris. Anything further on that motion? All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Councilor King? Yes. Councilor Crow? Yes. Councilor Gordon? Yes. Councilor Finn? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Leang? Yes. Councilor yes. Zamucci? President Hughes? Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Councilor Flores. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, at the last meeting, we did set to date as the evening that most, both Ms. McKinney, our, um, the city's real estate appraiser, the contractor real estate appraiser and economist, as well as the attorney for our city council, Mr. Jim Shea, to be in attendance. At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Pam McKinney, so that she can give her comments and involve relative to her um, involvement in this project. We'll then allow Q and A from the from the body, and then proceed to have Mr. Shea come forward. So, Ms. McKinney. just just a just a point of clarification from the clerk, if that's if she can address the body, is that something that can be Sure. Thank you. A point of parliamentary procedure. Yes, Council Council. This matter isn't an agenda. It's not, it's not, there's no motion before us. The, the matter that the motion that come out of the committee, if someone makes a motion well, to approve on the motion we can make, oh, we can ask questions. So motion, people, motion, but there's nothing motion to approve us. made by Council before us, seconded by Council Harris. So on the motion. Yeah, on the motion. Thank you, Madam President. Yeah. On the motion. Thank you, Mr. Parliamentarian. Uh, on the motion, Ms. McKinney, please come forward. Hi. Thank you, Pam. We have great respect for your, we have, we have great, great respect uh, for you and your involvement in our projects and our past projects and your advice to us. And I know we've had a chance to discuss briefly prior to each day, but for those in the audience, for those at home, we'd love to for everyone else around the world, I would like to get your take on this conveyance, and in particular, we talked about um, the scale of this project, the economies of scale, and the intangible benefits, as well as the opportunity to activate our main streets that wouldn't be provided without uh, this command. So, sure, uh, I understand that some of what was described by the appraisal has been presented, and you know, I and. and there by a description of the conveyance itself, but it might be helpful for me just to uh, summarize uh, what the conveyance consists of and then talk about uh, both the value that has been forward by the appraisal and also, uh, to your question, what else beyond the price uh, is being uh, uh, re received, if you will, as a result of the conveyance. Um, and as you know, uh, or may know, um, the, uh, the conveyance as it's been uh, conceived to this point has two parts. Uh, there are lots of various uh, sort of details, but they're fundamentally two parts. Uh, one is that the development sponsor uh, is to receive uh, a parcel that is sort of buried on the Hancock lot today uh, to be assembled with land which they already own. So a conveyance from the city of a part of the Hancock lot to the development sponsor. And part two is a conveyance from the development sponsor to the city of Quincy uh, to enable the widening of uh, Hancock Street, the creation of 
of pu public realm improvements in Hancock Street, as well as the use of what are the, what is now private land to enable the creation of a public access from Hancock Street to what will be a public garage in the middle of the Hancock lot. And uh, I, I, I talk about these two parts because you because because the conveyance isn't uh, you, you can't talk about the conveyance without recognizing that there are uh, properties going from the city to the developer and from the developer to the city. Both parts have to be acknowledged. So it's a swap, if you will, of sorts. It happens that the land that the city intends to convey to the private sponsor is bigger than the parcels that the developer intends to convey to the city by about 4,500 square feet. So the city will give about a 10,000 square foot lot, again, without frontage, it's a landlocked parcel uh, in the middle of the Hancock lot. The city will give that 10,000 feet to the developer to combine with its existing land, and the developer will peel a piece of their existing land off of the Hancock Street frontage as well as land which runs again from Hancock Street uh, back to the garage, totally about 5,600 feet. So 10,000 from the city, 5,600 square feet to the city. Uh, so a, a net uh, receipt, if you will, by the development sponsor of about 4,500 square feet. Now, again, it's in those, it's, you can't, you don't get one without the other. They, they go in lockstep. Um, and, you know, I think that, so let's talk about the value first, and then we'll come back to the intangibles, because there is something beyond the money. Um, the value of the conveyance in total has to consider, again, the give and the get. And um, it's important to recognize that the entirety of the conveyance is in service of a development outcome at the end. So you can't just value the little strip along the front, and you can't just value the little strip along the side, and you can't just value uh, 10,000 square feet of city parking land as landlocked with no frontage. All of these conveyances go to enable a development to occur. And the, the appraiser has rightly taken, and I've reviewed the appraisal closely, uh, has rightly taken the view that the value of the conveyance is essentially the difference between what the developer has before the conveyance versus what the developer has after the conveyance. It's, the, you know, all of it being a highest and best use for residential development in the end. So, uh, again, just to clarify, before the conveyance, the developer has a 22,200 square foot parcel on which uh, they can develop according to uh, capacity studies that were done by qualified engineers, can develop a, a 90, essentially a 93,600 square foot residential building. After the conveyance, again, with that incremental addition of 4,500 square feet, they have a parcel that is now 26,700 square feet, again, 4,500 square feet bigger, on which they can build 116,000 square feet of residential development. So their project is being enhanced by the extra 4,500 square feet of land area that they get at, at, after the conveyance is done. And that additional square footage capacity leads to, guess what, a higher value. So if it's worth, and, the, and again, the appraiser has done a very nice job, I think, of selecting comps and adjusting comps. Uh, it's, their property is worth $2.8 million before the conveyance. Their property is worth $3.5 million after the conveyance which means that uh, they have a value, a, a delta, if you will, uh, 
of about five hundred thousand uh, dollars. That I'm sorry, three point three million. Uh, so three point three million minus two point eight million gives you a half a million dollars of enhanced value as a result of the overall conveyance. Now that works out to about $125 a foot for the land that's being conveyed, which again, I would underscore, is generally consistent with, guess what, that other conveyance that you looked at not too long ago. And, and again, the methodology here of looking at development capacity and gives that the value of development capacity is, is, a, is the same essential methodology uh, delivering essentially a, a similar result on a, on a per land basis. Uh, so, in, in my opinion, the, the appraisal has been done appropriately. The, the, the price, if you will, is a reasonable price uh, for a market rate conveyance. But I think it's important to recognize um, to uh, Councilor LaForce's question that there is uh, there are intangibles, I think, beyond the price that uh, are worth mentioning. And again, the, the public realm improvements uh, in Hancock Street, and very importantly, the public's ability to access this garage that you're building, or we're we'll rebuilding, um, from Hancock Street are absolutely essential. Uh, to the functioning of the downtown in the way that it has been planned and talked about to this point. And without ownership of the private land uh, that's needed to install those improvements, you cannot execute on the vision uh, that has been just talked about. Uh, again, so essential is that Hancock garage access. Um, in addition, the uh, linking of this project to the public <coughs> results in a much more efficient use of not just the development sponsor's land, so more units, but frankly, it makes the use of the city's land contribution, that 10,000 feet, it actually gives it a reason to be because Otherwise, the highest and best use of that land is it's a landlocked parcel without frontage, and it's really only in an assemblage with the adjoining lands that that parcel can realize its true potential uh, for uh, residential uh, development. That's the highest and best use today. And last, I think uh, it's worth mentioning that Again, this linkage between the development parcel and the garage provides some additional revenue, frankly, to, and again, reason for being for the public garage. It helps to support uh, the revenue stream that will eventually be needed to, uh, to generate uh, debt service uh, to cover at least a portion of pro rata share. Of, of at least a portion of, uh, of the garage construction. So again, those are those other things, the importance of the Hancock garage linkage, the importance of widening sidewalks and so on, are hard to put a dollar uh, amount to, but again, I think it's uh, helpful or important to understand that first is the price, and is it fair and reasonable from a market perspective? And then, are there things, and I believe there are, about the conveyance itself, which help to advance the broader vision for downtown? Uh, so that's that's it in a nutshell. So I think the other um, piece that I had is relative to the accounting project. Is it's important to note so that the city is not granting any tax relief no. through this LTA. And secondly, I just wanted you to talk on the new growth. So today, um, this reference is one of my favorite topics, blighted properties, the existing blighted properties are contributing 40,000 annually to the tax rolls. When this project comes online, the anticipation is 478,000 annually. 
on the tax rolls with a increase of a thousand, over a thousand percent increase in annual property tax, everyone straight up property tax, no one to own agreements, no six agreements. So yes, what exactly. does that explain? But unlike the O'Connell uh, project, which had some uh, tax relief associated with it, in order to make possible that high rise construction typology, this is a market based stick over podium style development, not unlike other projects that are being constructed in Quincy, and it will pay taxes in accordance with your assessing office's uh, assessment for the parcel, both um, as it sits, there'll be a land attribution, which again, if the property, uh, much of it uh, is today exempt, at least the portion that, that is now in city hands, um, and, uh, and, of course, on completion, you will have 171 units generating at more taxes for the city of Quincy. Again, that, that's, that's not intangible. <laughs> that's, that's real. You know, and I think um, the other piece to recognize in this, you know, we did a great job in, um, in explaining the commands that is in front of and the enhanced value that the wide and sidewalk brings, and I think part of um, that's what we're able to say through the Streetworks learning process with a lot of the planning documentation that lived as a result of that, you know, was a prior um, version of this body that voted the design guidelines for the downtown. And this was exactly what the city spelled out as our vision, as what we wanted downtown. We wanted to activate the main street, we wanted to widen the sidewalk, we wanted to install sidewalk cafes, and it's those public, public realm improvements that this city body set a policy as to what our expectations were, the LBC group, to their credit, came forward with a, with a proposal uh, that does just that. So I just really wanted to recognize that it's a policy set forward here that triggers this project that they literally had to back their building off to become into compliance, and that's why you know us being able to come forward um, and do the land swap, like you said, to get that public access. If you do not have the ownership, you cannot execute. And we've talked about the liability that exists with the town brook through the atrium space that we're now calling it, through the drainage and the utility infrastructure that we know, that we know has long been antiquated and has been a part of the reason for, this, for um, the delay in development of downtown, is we can have the infrastructure in place that could handle it in downtown, and now we do. So I think those are all, you know, when we talk about tangible and intangible benefits, and what you well, I guess I would, I would make only one, one additional comment, and that is um, that the development sponsor here uh, could have gone forward with a buy right development uh, at least 18 months ago. So, that, and, 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 and so it's, they, they have, they have uh, to their credit, uh, they have worked to try to accommodate uh, not just the letter of the design guidelines and so on, but to try to accommodate the city's needs with respect to what's a pretty complicated underground uh, construction. And I appreciate you recognizing that because it isn't just the COC process through the planning board that is an opportunity for downtown development. They could go through the zoning board and go forward with the project through a different manner. Um, this is meant to streamline the process and it does give the opportunity to work with the city. I do want to thank the uh, LEC for that. I do, I do uh, Madam Chair, I yield my time uh, for the council for the <coughs> and then I'd like to just reserve the right to then leave up with Mr. Shea once everyone else has had their questions and Mr. McKay has questions. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else? Yeah. Councilor Lee. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, Ken. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to come to and speak with us and awaiting the three hours you've been here. I just have a question for you on the appraised value that we have in front of us. So the original amount is um, the net valuation of like $500,000. Mm -hmm. And then it says in here in the revised so altogether we got Hours ago, that it's now going to be appropriated for, um, for I'm sorry, purchased for four hundred seventy-three thousand and sixty dollars. That's right. So there's a difference in amount. Do we have a new appraisal amount, or what, why what, is it what we have is uh, because the property, the project had to be redesigned, 
re-engineered several times over again to accommodate the city's needs for a, a quite a specific brook relocation in the atria. Uh, they have overspent their engineering budget because of that additional requirement of the city to... I'm sorry, they as in... It, the, the development sponsor has had to spend their money more than once, in other words, to redesign to accommodate the city's requirements. And uh, Woodward and Curran, as your uh, engineering consultants, did a thorough review of the engineering uh, expenditures on the project uh, to verify, validate that there is in fact a premium cost associated with their engineering, having to re-engineer uh, to accommodate the city's request. Uh, and that reflects the, the so-called offset. You, you may recall when we did the O'Connell uh, appraisal, there were what we call development premium costs associated with, in that case, park construction and park maintenance. Remember that? That, that represented an offset because looking at the comps, if you will, in the market, no other comps had to spend extra money to accommodate city requirements for, in that case, uh, delivering a, uh, a, a park maintenance, you know, in perpetuity, et cetera. And in this instance, it was a matter of, again, that 18 months worth of engineering and re-engineering in response to city requirements for the subgrade uh, infrastructure that resulted in, uh, again, a, a premium, if you will, to the development budget uh, on the order of, I think it was $27,000, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, that amount was not simply taken uh, on at face value. It was subjected to a peer review by your own uh, engineers to establish whether or not uh, the, the extra engineering costs were valid and appropriate. And I think, I don't know if Dave Boyd is here or not, but Dave Boyd from Woodward, Woodward and Curran uh, did a, a workup uh, and analysis of their um, their engineering uh, cost budgets, and that is what results in the offset. So the appraisal is as it stated. It's minus so, minus, minus, minus off. an offset to reflect this additional premium cost. So just to reiterate on what you're telling me, so the 500,000 is the appraised value. Mm -hmm. The developers had worked with engineers on a plan that they were originally going to go with. We had asked them to make adjustments. That was our request as a city. They had to incur additional costs because of our request. And that document and that amount was approved. I, I don't have that document in front of me. I'm not saying that they didn't incur costs. I, I know engineering costs are very expensive. When you go to even just print a plan, when you're talking about 24 by 36, it's very expensive. But you know, I, the only thing I see in front of me is the net valuation is 500,000. And then there's a sentence in here, or two sentences, that say, OK, well, now it's going to be 473. And, I'm not saying that Wood and Curran aren't qualified to approve that document, but we're the ones that are approving that value, not Wood and Curran. We're the ones approving yeah, the purchase price. So, I, so you know, is there anybody that can speak to that or to pass our paperwork up here so we can just take a look and see, uh, you know, sort of validated that this was the amount that was, that was overcharged to them? Yeah, so if you, if you need to, uh, to hear directly from the from the horse, if you will. Uh, I think Dave is well, Dave. Well, Dave would have been better. Yeah, I'll be back as him. Through you to uh, Council again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. So there was a request by LBC to look at a number of expenses that they had. This is the documentation. Um, so, what's yellow was deemed uh, appropriate, and that's how we came up with 27,000. We're more than welcome to have that. And uh, if you'd like to have Dave White explain to you what the sub items are, it's basically. You don't have copies of any chance to You can, can we let them 
Now that copy there, can you pass it down? Yeah, that no, I'm just saying to my colleagues, and they can help with that. Yeah, well, the, well, again, the, um, the 27,000 is represented in that particular, there's a large list of questions that were put before, <coughs> would it in current, and uh, the bottom line is those are the ones that were verified and uh, represented. I don't want to keep you up here while I'm going through it. No, not, not a problem. I just wanted you to know that you asked. That's what. That is the basis of the twenty-seven thousand. Okay. Can we get copies of these from the office? Uh, uh, and and can actually just have a second question for you come back up. Yeah. Just. I. am not an engineer, so uh, <laughs> I prefer to have an engineer speak to the speak to that cost. But no. But anyway. Um, Yes, so the yeah, second question I have here, you talked a lot about the importance of the garage and how yes. that project is essential to this project and how they're sort of co-dependent on each other. Why is it then that in the appraisal we're not considering the garage? Uh, the garage is not a, a part of the land now. It's just, it's not uh, appropriate to the development of a, of a market rate conveyance for land. Uh, it is important, obviously, to the economics of the garage. Uh, the, the land lease, or the, the, the uh, parking lease, uh, is important to the uh, construction of the garage and the way that the garage works. Um, and I think that because the garage is a composite that will serve not just this project, but many other projects, uh, it is important to look at the composite of the garage operation and the garage cost uh, rather than try to look at uh, the value, if you will, again, not land value, but value attributable to any one project that may rely on the garage. Because the, the garage, frankly, can't uh, survive uh, economically without all of the users who are expected to come uh, and exhibit demand there uh, doing that. <coughs> and at this point, as I think we've talked about before, uh, the final cost of the garage is, remains uh, a question mark. We don't, we don't have a final cost. We have a formula. We know how the formula is going to be applied. Uh, we don't uh, yet have a completed performa that will show exactly how all of the parking rent streams are going to come together to support uh, the operation. And so uh, it's, I think, at, it, it, to say that it's difficult understates the problem, if you will, in uh, trying to parse out, you know, value contribution to the garage to any one project, because uh, no, no one project is, is going to be sufficient to uh, to cover the operating or the debt service. No, I understand. You're, you're, you're mentioning that you know, we don't have the final cost um, for the city to build out the garage yet is, is a separate issue going for itself. But again, going back to, and I'm not the appraiser here, you're, you're the expert, and I, I trust your opinion, so okay. I apologize if I'm you know, digging into this a little bit no, too much and having you explain it, but I'm under the understanding that any project within that area is going to be desirable for a couple of reasons. You're close to the train. You have accessibility to parking, you know, that's why we have a raw side that's up in the scene a lot. And that makes it attractive for these retailers and other developers to be in this area because you have access to both. Mm -hmm. It jacks up the value um, of not just the land, but the houses in the area to be close and in the vicinity of, again, public transportation, whether it be bus routes or T stations, and parking. And, and so if those things affect the, the value of a home or, or the value of a retail spot when you're talking about these per square foot, why wouldn't it then affect the piece of land, essentially, that we're raising? Uh, you should understand that the value accounts for that. The value is predicated on the comps for other downtown sites that have similar attributes, uh, that have parking, that have proximity to T. So understand that it's not as if the, uh, we'll say, the influence of having parking nearby or the influence of being in the downtown in your transit is wholly unaccounted for. That's accounted for in the way that the land comps have been selected and adjusted. 
So uh, in that sense, the value of the location and the features and attributes of the land is absolutely being accounted for in the appraisal and in the price. Uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that the revenue stream associated with this project's contribution to a garage operating pro forma, the O'Connell's contribution, the contribution maybe of courthouse occupants, the contribution of retail customers and employees, each of those uh, demand sources is going to exert a different kind of influence on the garage economics and therefore the measuring of uh, how the uh, how any one project is going to help the city build a garage is is, a, is hard to parse out project to project. Okay, so there are too many unknowns basically for the garage to be able to do comes with it. Value yeah, because it's, it's an aggregate, the garage value and the benefit to the city of having all of these parties helping is going to result in a blended pro forma and a blended value for the garage. Again, hard to parse out whose contribution is, uh, is making the garage possible and how do you measure you know, that benefit that comes from this source versus that source. We just know that everybody's contribution is necessary, or is going to be necessary, to getting the garage built and to make its operation feasible and uh, and, and its functioning and its, its ability to be debt service viable. Um, but you should understand that the value of the land that the city is receiving accounts for the benefit of having that parking nearby and being in the downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Anyone else wishing to speak? All right, I think there's a little redirect from Council of Forest. Council of Forest. Thank you. 